Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin our panel discussion on the un increasing trend of unofficial response to animals in disasters, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention an important update regarding the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions, F and H remaining, on the original schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled but please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will present them to our panel. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in all your social media postings to help spread awareness of the conference. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that a recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year once it has been properly edited. It is our immense privilege to present this panel today. We are so honored to have so many outstanding members of the animal disaster world with us. Dr. Steve Glassy will be chairing our panel and he is with Animal Evac New Zealand. Dr. Jackson Z, Director of the Disaster Relief Unit for Four Paws International and our platinum sponsor. Adam Parascandola, Vice President of the Humane Society International and one of our gold sponsors. Jennifer Gardner with the International Fund for Animal Welfare and one of our gold sponsors. And Gerardo Huertas, an animal disaster risk reduction consultant joining us from Costa Rica. The wealth of experience here, we're looking so forward to this panel. Steve? all yours. Thank you so much, Jenny. And look, you know, we do have a great panel. So it's probably one of the first sort of times we've we've pulled together such thought leaders uh, in an international space to have the conversation uh, about the emerging trend of untrained volunteers responding in disasters. Um, today's panel is really just an opportunity to pose some questions to this expert panel. I'm also quite conscious that we've got all the big names. We've got the, the four paws, the I-4, the HSI, um, and we don't actually have anyone from these smaller groups. So in today's panel, we also encourage those that are from any size of animal organization or disaster organization to please participate and put your thoughts uh, into, into the chat, and we'll try to uh, accommodate those as we go. Likewise, um, certainly as we progress, there will be opportunities to um, address any questions that are unresolved. So last year, at, at uh, well not last year, in 2021, GADMAC, um, I presented on, on a session called Do No Harm, um, and Do No Harm is a concept that came really from the humanitarian aid space, where organizations, individuals, we're responding to human-centric disaster response, such as uh, humanitarian emergencies, and actually causing potentially more harm than good, although but in most cases the intentions were there. Now we're starting to see this, this trend evolve in animal disaster response, uh, locally, nationally, and also internationally. Um, and certainly with social media, the ease of international travel, certainly as it's um, uh, becoming more restored, this is going to be an ongoing challenge. Now, we've already had panels from Australia and the US uh, with experts sort of speakers from those respective zones. So now it's a time to sort of escalate the conversation from a national or a regional level to the international level. Um, so looking at the discussions that we've had and the, some of the concerns or issues or trends that we have seen, um, the themes and issues appear to be around uh, accountability 
and a trans and transparency. So I've got a question, and look, I haven't actually given the opportunity for our presenters to be fully briefed on these, so that they're going in, in hot into the, into these questions. Uh, we give no one a um, we ask everyone the hard questions here, uh, and so the first sort of uh, conversation point is around ethical issues in animal disaster response in the international context. So one of the one of the thoughts I want to put to the panel. Is, is responding without mitigating or prevention complicit in animal suffering? If we're just responding, and if we're, if we're getting involved in a response, whether we're a big organization or a small organization, we're doing the sexy side of disaster management, but we're not doing the other parts, um, is that complicit uh, in terms of the suffering of, of animals? So I'm going to now open that back up to to my uh, my team of of panel panelists, and I'm sure they'll have something to say. Well, I hope so. Um, if if that's okay, Adam, because you just talked for like half an hour nonstop a few minutes ago, uh, I will start. I think we we probably would do a, a good for the conference if we backpedal a little. Um, this is a for, for international response in, in places that are not as developed as the US or Australia. So the ethical elements uh, would come second and please take it from a guy that lives in the developing world. So, uh, so hopefully that will give me some perspective. To, to begin with this issue, you know, if we unpack it, <clears throat> Responding to a disaster in which other groups are coming uh, unannounced and probably less organized would uh, be really bad for business because the, the country, the governments and the officials and everybody that is supposed to be giving you the, the go ahead uh, to, uh, to do the, the, your job is going to be looking at the other guys and saying, well, this is crazy. And uh, I, they might not be able to uh, differentiate between them and you and uh, one tag may not be enough to to be hanging around your your neck and uh, this is um i think i think i have a a really interesting example of that uh, during the uh, haiti earthquake um the ministry of agriculture <clears throat> did not had never discussed anything with animal welfare organizations and uh, right after the quake, about 20 some NGOs wanted to go to, to Haiti and start talking to them and start saving animals or helping animals and so forth. I think we had the, uh, the, the wisdom, it wasn't me, but it was other guys, um, that to put together a coalition that uh, at the end of the day uh, was a really good coalition of animal welfare organizations for Haiti. Um, we called it ARC, but it doesn't matter. The point is that only two guys represented that coalition with the Minister of Ministry of uh, Agriculture. That was important for them to, to see some method uh, behind it and some coherence. And the monies were put together, just like Adam was saying, the monies <clears throat> pour in at the beginning and then they don't uh, come anymore because there is such a thing as as disaster uh, exhaustion, people just get tired of this disaster. Another one will come, sadly, sadly enough, and uh, the monies are going to go that way. So, how do you do mitigation, or how do you do uh, reconstruction when the monies dry out? That is uh, difficult. So, uh, pulling your resources together, I think, is I think is vital. But more importantly, is to give a, a professional image of what. It's happening. Remember, we are at the international stage here. Not everything is as as cool and organized as uh, in the um, examples we heard before. So um, I think uh, I think the elephant in the room is to still uh, pose a professional image at the beginning of of the event, uh, unless you've you've done your homework and you have contacts in every single vulnerable country there is, which is a you know a tall order. So maybe um, starting from that point, we can go into the ethics of um, of what do we do or what don't we do in a in a foreign country. Good points. Other other panelists, anything that Herado's raised that you want to expand on? I mean, one I think one of the challenges is how do we 
uh, that, you know, having that sort of coalition approach is, is absolutely fantastic and obviously worked really well. Um, but I think we're starting to see a, a, a trend where organisations work outside systems, let it be systems that are made up on the day. Um, I remember seeing the um, Hurricane Katrina documentary, uh, Dark Water Rising, and it contrasted the Humane Society response along with, with um, Randy Covey, I think it was, um, and the Winn-Dixie crew who, who basically plundered the the Walmart every night drinking alcohol. They they didn't take any rests and and you know literally destroyed their lives and also probably the the well being of animals and families as well in the process. So how do we how do we get the the organisations that's not represented on the panel into the fold and understanding how they can contribute in a meaningful way? I I have a. Um... Uh, one last suggestion, uh, and I promise not to grab the mic anymore. Um, every every challenge should be an opportunity for us. <clears throat> and uh, these people uh, that come in unannounced and un pro probably unprepared, and we call them unofficial just because we are on the other side of the, we feel that we are on the other side of the fence, that's not necessarily fair. Uh, the reason they come is because they perceive there is a need and that it's not been fulfilled. That perception may be wrong. And in most cases, uh, it, it works the other way. Um, I was saying in a previous presentation a couple of days ago that one of the best, the, the highest luxuries I had with my teams uh, in the old days when the, they deployed the, to different places, for big disasters, we would carry some um, body that was a specialist in communication and in community uh, awareness. Communication is important because then you can tell uh, the public what the boundaries are, what the dangers are of, of unannounced uh, rescues, and uh, where to go if they want to help. And I have another example for this. Uh, during the volcanic eruption in Chile of uh, Chaitén Volcano, it's one of the 2,000 plus volcanoes that exist in Chile. Chile has more volcanoes than parking spots, by the way. Um, it, uh, it was overnight. People had to be evacuated overnight by boat because the volcano went crazy very, very fast. And they had to leave every single pet behind. The army would not allow those animals to come in. The HSUS and, um, and us were in, you know, eventually came to, uh, to the ground and tried to get into the area. It was not possible because there was a 20 minute window of opportunity if the volcano went up again to uh, cook you to, uh, alive, basically with uh, pyroclastic flows and fumes and, and what have you. However, <clears throat> in Santiago, the capital of Chile, uh, this spontaneous groups and movements became really, really big and they were uh, marching to the, they marched to the uh, presidential house and to the uh, Congress by the hundreds, demanding that the animals be evacuated. And I had great pictures to show you of people power, you know, big banners and a lot of noise and so forth in Santiago. Eventually, I, I, I have a great uh, image of the Minister of Defense and his generals coming into a plane and, and taking me with them for 20 minutes to go into Chaiten city um, to count the dogs and feed them and so forth and prepare them for evacuation. Why? Because of public pressure. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't up to us, it was up to the Chileans. So that is, I think, an a, a enormous power that needs to be harnessed rather than put aside because they, they are not trained or official. There, there, is, there is a job for all of them to do. Um, and eventually another minister, the Minister of Environment, came with another plane to pick 120 dogs at a time in one shot, which we took, you know, the humane societies that were um, present there from abroad, took, um, took into uh, another city and finally started putting, putting them back to, to their own, uh, with their owners. And it took us quite a while, uh, more than a month to reunite them, but it was worth it. And I think that without that public uh, people power, we would have not done it. That's a great example. Thanks for that, Gerardo. 
I'm going to hand over to Jen Gardner for I4. Um, I believe she's got some thoughts on a couple of the, the points that have been raised so far. So, Jen, your thoughts. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back to the ethical obligations because I do think that that is something that we as the international organizations, you know, we really do have to lead by example. And we all know that the fundraising is there for rescue, right? And I think that the local groups realize that too, based on our successful fundraising campaigns. But one of the things that I think is um, really important for us all to keep in mind is that we do have to commit to recovery in these communities because, um, you know, it's we need to start shifting that conversation that. Uh, yeah, the response happened, but it's going to be a long time for these communities to recover. And ultimately, if they are a high risk community for a future disaster, we really need to invest in resilience. And that's where I think we have that complete picture. And we really do have that ethical obligation to help the community through the entire cycle. And that way, if there wasn't a system set up in the beginning for um, volunteers and organizations to help out, in that recovery and resilience piece, we can start to set up those frameworks and build those best practices that work for that community and wrap in the local organizations to really own it. Because as we all know, disasters are best managed at the local level. We really are only getting involved when the disasters escalate. But these communities and these organizations, they're there 365 days a year. This is their community, it's their backyard. And, you know, we, we need to really shift that conversation to um, working on the front side with disasters. We shouldn't wait for a disaster to happen to have an unofficial response. We should be engaging before the response happens so that we all know what our role is to play. We all have the training of what, of, of what is needed and, and we have those best practices that really fit for that particular community. Yeah. Can I I just wanted to to add to that. I think that's that's really well said, Jen. I think um, you know it. I, I've noticed a shift actually in the overall like um, you know the sort of UN conferences and everything. There is a shift even in that kind of language more towards risk reduction, right? Which is which is great. And I think you know I. I'm just going to be honest, like we faced challenges initially, even internally, right? Because like everyone's like, you know, the rescue, the response, you know, that's where the the, the fundraising, the sexy part of it occurs in, in getting folks to understand that importance of working on these situations. But besides, you know, making the communities prepared, helping them recover, you know, when you look at places like, um, you know, states like Kerala and India, every year there's floods. We know every year there's going to be floods. So what are we going to respond every year? Or can we, you know, can we help the community learn how to deal with this situation? So each year when the floods are coming, they know they got to move the animals to X, Y, or Z place. They have that facility um, because yeah, in the end, we can't respond everywhere. Like, right. It, especially, unfortunately, increasingly, you know, with the increasing number of disasters and intensities. So Anyway, that, I think that was really well said, Jen. I totally agree. And look, just building on that point, Adam, you, you mentioned about the increasing number of disasters that we're facing. You know, there's overpopulation, there's climate change, there's more um, urbanization, there's there's a whole range of factors which are, are, are you know filling why we're having more more of these disasters that are exceeding that local capacity. Um, so that that is, but you know, my my sort of sense is painting a picture that that the current sort of just just responding is not sustainable. Um, and so that disaster risk reduction that you, that you're referencing, you know, is really key if we want to actually save more animals in a more sustainable um, uh, manner. Um, and that raises the that raises the dilemma a little bit um, around, you know, does does these disasters and the responses create actually a dependency, a financial dependency, on some charities um, because. Does, does the disaster and the suffering actually incentivize um, response? Does it de-incentivize, uh, disincentivizes mitigation? Because if you're responding, you're generating income. Um, and then we get into the whole sort of conversation of, 
well, what happens with with the funds if if the if the if the organisation? Because let's face it, a lot of this work is done by charities. It's not done by government departments or fire services or armies, etc., um, that don't have to do fundraising for for their for their functions. Um, so we, we we've got this sort of intermix of we need to generate funds to actually do our work. And we've got to we've got to in some ways use some of these situations to highlight the plight so that we can actually undertake the disaster risk reduction. Um, but we do have that. Do we have the ethical dilemma around um, the response creating a dependency for financial sort of um, income for for you know for charities in this sort of space? So I put it back to to again our, our wider panel. Yeah, I can jump in, uh, Steve. I think that um, you are right that we have seen that in a lot of cases where organizations every year have flooding every year they basically write the same proposal uh, to look for funding to feed the same group of animals that you know we fed the year prior and I think you know for a while when we were really um, just focused on response and didn't have that greater risk reduction uh, program you know we we were doing that because we didn't know what else to do but now um, I think we've learned from that and I you know, investing in that risk reduction and preparedness is really key. And I think for us, one of the things that's been really um, impactful is working with governments because governments often have budgets set aside specifically for disaster response. And you ask them, well, how much budget do you have set aside for preparedness? Oh, well, we don't have that. Okay, so how can we build that into the budget? And, you know, it's a conversation of, of where does that money come from? Can it shift from, you know, village fund activities to village fund activities that relate to animals affected by disasters and creating plans? And that's really been a great way for us to enter into these communities and, and shift that, um, that pattern and instead looking for ways to uh, invest that budget um, using government funding that already exists uh, to build disaster plans for animals in that community. And so that way when a response does happen, the needs aren't so great because they already had the plan in place and, and hopefully, um, you know, they don't need that additional funding unless it's a, a catastrophic level disaster. Excellent points, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Adam or Jackson or Gerardo, do you have any sort of thoughts that have come up as a result of the last sort of few points raised by, by Jen or otherwise? So um, the, the sit Oh, sorry, do we have someone there? Just Jackson. one just one note uh, on, on this. Um, on my previous job, um, it, for any organization of, of any given, you know, of a regular or big size, the fundraising uh, deal, the division, the, uh, the function is a serious business. And it's, mm -hmm. it's well, or, well orchestrated and scheduled. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work and a lot of investment planned throughout the year, disasters can only disrupt uh, a previously uh, neat plan for fundraising because you can only go to the same uh, donors for more money. You were going to be talking to them about dogs or uh, bears or whatever you, you were planning to do uh, on your regular work activities. And all of a sudden a disaster comes, who are you gonna ask for money? Uh, probably, probably uh, the same donor. So it's not it's not like a big uh, bag of gold that, that you uh, grab and, and run with it uh, for disasters, for disaster response. And on the other hand, just like Jan said, uh, sustainability is, is really important. How many times do you go to the same place to help animals? Uh, how is that sustainable at all? So I think uh, I think moving towards uh, <clears throat> risk reduction is, is, is logic. Uh, everybody's doing it, but on the same tone, you could ask yourselves, why is the Red Cross still saving people with their ambulances all over the place? Uh, and why shouldn't they, why, sh why don't they stop uh, that? Because that's not sustainable. Well, the, the, uh, the answer is obvious, and that is probably the balance that the humane societies need to, uh, to keep. Absolutely. Thank you, Roberto. We do have a couple of questions if anyone is up for them. Um, the first one is 
There are people that do not like to be aligned to the institutions and they will operate anyway. Most of the time off the lights and they are very often very well linked to the community. Disaster management requires the capacity and the will to listen. Communication is key. So have any of you had the experience of being able to successfully incorporate some of these um, unofficial rescuers? Adam referred to a successful story, but I'm wondering if anyone else would have the opportunity to take what could be a challenging situation and have it be beneficial for all of the groups responding. And a lot of the time, uh, these groups aren't disaster organizations, they're animal organizations who then want to get involved in disasters. So they may have an existing animal interest. They feel that the animal interests aren't being met during the disaster. So then they um, you know, cross over into the disaster response. And I suppose this is the, the terminology conflict we get with the widely used animal rescue. Um, when we talk about animal rescue and you talk about, you, and you talk about animal rescue with uh, the animal community, it means one thing, you speak to firefighters and public safety, animal rescue means something else. Um, so we do have a terminology um, challenge, I, I think. Um, but do, yeah, do any of the panelists have an example where there's been a sort of a spontaneous group that you've actually managed to bring into the fold, um, you know, successfully and, and, and why that was successful? Yeah, I think Jackson, were you going to say, I think Jackson had unmuted before. Were you going to say something, Jackson? You know. Hi, Adam. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, let's, I'm going to address the question first. Um, so I can say that um, we have failures. We have lots of stories of failures where things don't go well. Um, going into community and then being actually kicked out by the community for wanting to help because they thought we were with another group. Sometimes they, they identify all animal um, organizations as one cluster group. Um, so they don't see the individual groups or their merits or the services that they're providing. Um, so we've had that challenge. Um, separately, um, have we had any successes of working with on-site volunteers? Um, it depends on the, the type of response um, where we have or our partners have um, utilize volunteers in the feeding of animals during the pandemic. Um, and that required a lot of manpower. So our partners basically were able to provide the food that was um, prepared daily. And also with the assistance of local hotel, commissary and restaurant kitchens to make enough food to be able to distribute to all the communities to get out to all of the animals that needed to be fed since um, during the pandemic in some areas, um, this is specifically about Chennai and in India. Um, if there are no people in these industrial areas, there are still animals there. They normally are fed when people are there. When there's no work to be done and nobody's leaving the house, these areas are abandoned. So animals are just basically left not knowing what happened to all the people who used to feed them. Um, and then that was the service that was being provided for many of those animals. So that is the volunteers. And they did that through social media. I mean, there was WhatsApp groups. There were Telegram groups. Um, the management of the groups, I can tell you, was very, very challenging. Um, but they were able to do so. Um, and we were supporting them since we couldn't be on site. Nobody was allowed to travel at the time. So that's what we were able to support. Um, but what they did on the longer term is to identify um, locations of where those animals lived, how many animals there are in the community, so that longer term they were be better able to address sort of um, ideas of um, CNVR and um, other work that that the work from the disasters can lead into. No, good, good point. Thanks for that, that perspective, um, uh, Jackson. And look, I think uh, Adam sort of mentioned before uh, about using sort of you know drone operators spontaneously using that sort of expertise you know during the sort of disaster response. Um, we we have another question in the in the um, Q and A box around um, the the challenge of people coming in and working outside of the incident command system. 
Um, and I suppose in the international context, sometimes incident command systems don't even exist. <laughs> um, you know, ICS um, is used obviously in the, IC in, in the US and some of the countries adopt it. Um, you know, in other countries they use UK models and there's, there's and sometimes they generally, you know, there's a similar approach, but in some places there is no command system. Um, and, you know, I remember having a, an actual uh, presentation by Craig Fugate from, from FEMA and he spoke about ICS and, you know, he's a very experienced emergency manager, highly um, quite an authority on this sort of subject. Um, and he said, look, ICS is a system by definition, uh, it can be exceeded, it fails. Um, and that sort of prompted the, the question around in disasters, um, because, you know, ICS is an incident management system, not necessarily a disaster management system when your systems are exceeded. Um, and he raised a sort of good point of saying, you know, is this when, when communities get out and do things without the permission of officials, is this civil disobedience or is this community resilience? And I know that um, certainly from, from my perspective, what I've sort of seen is emergency management, and I've been an emergency manager, we often say, look, communities, you have to take responsibility. You have to get prepared, get a plan, get yourself organized. You need to be ready. You're going to be on yourself. But if communities get ready and then a little bit over ready and they start to form themselves formally and start creating their own plans and they start buying their own equipment, suddenly emergency management like, whoa, 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 don't, don't get that organized. Uh, we want to be in control of all this. So we do have this, even outside of animal disaster management, we've got this philosophical conflict around community resilience, civil disobedience, how prepared do we want the community to be and how autonomous do we want them to be during a time when the system is exceeded and they are going to be on their own. So I put that back to the, to the group and, and welcome any, any, any um, points or, or counter arguments uh, from the esteemed panel. Yeah, I'll just real quickly say, Steve, I think, you know, this 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 issue of the the and going back to the a little bit the earlier question of these folks that show up and and integrating them, even even if you can't integrate them, I think communicating with them is is critical. So so it's very frustrating when you're in a situation. Um again, I'll just go back to Antakya because this is the most recent one in my my mind in Turkey. Um, because there were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of requests for, you know, people to have this first people to go and look for people's animals. And so, you know, there are different groups that came from all over and like you, you would go, you know, trying to get to as many calls as possible. There were way more calls than there were responders. And then you get to a call and there's another group there. Right. So it's very frustrating because it's like, you know, it's not maximizing the efforts. And so we tried to sort of start communicating there was a language barrier we don't have an office in in turkey you know we worked with local uh some local vets and some local folks and we actually used some of those individuals who showed up um as translators to come with us and do translation and stuff which was really really helpful otherwise google translate works okay but it's a little challenging has challenges um but yeah just kind of coordinate like hey okay fine you guys are doing your own thing we're doing your our thing, you know, we're not going to maybe be one happy family, but can we at least communicate <laughs> so we understand like what calls you guys are going to and what we're going to so that we're not duplicating efforts. And so I think, you know, even if you can't bring people sort of into the fold, you know, still communicating with them is is important. Yeah. I'd like to follow up on Adam's comment. Um... It is really important to communicate, even if you can't work with groups. Um, but to follow up on the question from Erica, um, I don't know if everybody sort of knows what incident command is when we're out in the field. They simply see that there's a gap in the need that isn't being met. So they go out and they do it um, without any of the understanding or the safety precautions to be able to address um, all the things that were mentioned earlier, which is, you know, before you commit, you need to know what you're committing to. And they don't always know. They only see the suffering and they want to address. Um, as, a, as a mitigation or recovery efforts, so what can we do about it? Um, I don't know. I mean, Steve just mentioned about preparedness and preparedness is great. And if they're very prepared, my problem 
the problems that we have seen is people are forgetful. <laughs> um, these are routine annual floods or annual storms or um, the, the risk or the hazard of fires is a routine one. Um, are they unaware? I don't believe so. I believe that they um, have other priorities and they don't think it's a risk. So I don't know if it's a communications or an understanding question in the community. Um, I wonder if this is an opportunity to address some of the things. I'm not sure if my, my camera is on, but I don't see my, myself. So I don't know if you guys can see me at all. Um, I really um, like to come back to Jennifer said, which is ethical obligations. Completely agree with you that, you know, we have to work from not just the response, but really into recovery. And my question is, when do we consider recovery is achieved? At the beginning of the recovery cycle, at the end of recovery cycle, and there's real questions of how long you have to stay there um, because everything seems normal and what is considered normal. Um, mitigation and preparedness, absolutely. Um, what does that look like for us within the animal response community um, in line with the um, emergency management. The challenge there for me lies in the definition in, in, in terms of now the disaster is done, now you got to help us with vaccinations, de, you know, desexing, spay, neutering, TNRs, and going on the list, and then this, that, and then the list comes really long. This is from our wonderful friends that we speak to, like um, example be Cairo, um, that you know the, the list goes on and on. They don't see it as a specific event. They see it as one large contiguous challenge that they, they have. Um, the legal framework, I think, is really important because what we're all talking about is when there's a legal framework, what if there isn't? And people are just doing. Um, and I find that really challenging, but a legal framework, not prescriptive, because what we talked about through this conference is when we talk about legal frameworks, um, governments don't like to be told what to do. They don't want you to specifically tell them what, they want a framework that they can develop their own plans in or that local communities or sub national communities can, can, can work on. And it has to be enforceable locally. Um, from the current disaster data, what we understand is more disasters are coming, but they're not gonna be big. They're gonna be smaller disasters, but just a lot of them. So being overwhelmed by the multitude of disasters is what's gonna hit the communities. Um, repeatedly. So basically small things happening a lot over a longer period of time, um, which will be a drain on energy, money, resources. Um, and I think that manpower and, and supplies are going to be um, the challenge as we have seen from the pandemic and currently here a war in Europe. Supply chains are going to be a, a major critical question. Um, as opposed to um, ICS system, I just want to address this real quickly. Um, I've seen where there's parallel systems happening at the same time, and they're not always the same in the same country. <laughs> um, and that makes it quite interesting for emergency management. Um, so there's multiple systems. Um, and then there's the adoption of something like the PRIM model from LEGS, which is the Livestock Emergency Guidelines and Standards. Um, the PRIM model just simplifies all of ICS into something really digestible by time and action for people who are not emergency management specialists. So simplification of the ICS model, sometimes it might be some easier to be accepted or digested by the communities that we work with. And um, these are great suggestions for them. So, um, but yeah, um, just to, just to um, summarize, um, I think that preparedness is great, but I think people are forgetful. And I'm not sure how to fix that. Is I, I, I see it a lot. We all see it often. Um, and I think communications might be key. I'm not sure how that communications um, should look like. Thanks. No, brilliant observations, Jackson, from certainly a, a number of years of solid experience. So thanks for sharing that with us. And I, I think sort of just drawing upon that sort of last sort of conversation, uh, just reflecting a bit is also around you know our lessons management and these lessons that have probably been identified um, and even learned in, in parallel sectors such as the humanitarian aid sector so if we look at the humanitarian aid sector they're probably a bit more evolved than than we are in terms of animal international disaster management or response um, and i i just wanted to sort of flags uh, a couple of points for for discussion one was around um, some of the 
some of the growing pains that we're having as a specialist sort of sector, um, this emerging trend of unqualified response coming into country and at an international level is something that the humanitarian aid sector has experienced. So there's a couple of things which um, they have put in place. Uh, one is uh, the Red Cross has developed a code of conduct for the Red Cross organizations and uh, international NGOs. However, it's very human centric in terms of its, its, its wording. So is that something that um, we could consider as a, as a collective? And the other side of it is the coordination mechanisms. Uh, the UN has the, the UN cluster system. Um, and how do we, how do we get um, uh, non-productive animal issues being put on the agenda of the UN cluster system during these international responses? So two points there around sort of codes of conduct for NGOs, um, and the other one is around UN sort of coordination systems, which are typically uh, come into play during those large scale international events. So I put the um, I put the mic back to our um, to our panelists for their thoughts. Um, I'll take that second question um, to address on the international level. So um, I currently serve as the Animal Issues Thematic Cluster for the NGO Major Group at the High Level Political Forum for the United Nations. Um, what that means is there's a bunch of animal-based organizations that work on animal protection topics across the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we identify and support the UN and its mission um, to meet the Sustainable Goals, which there are 17 of. They're all human-centric, um, but where animal welfare or animal protection meets that. Now, within the disaster field, for, there are two disaster organizations within the UN. One is called UN OCHA, which is the Office of uh, Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and um, the other one is called the Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. So we really work very closely with the UNDRR. The UN OCHA, um, as we call it, basically is simply the coordination function when there is a disaster. So they specifically only activate and they provide trainings but they are specifically um, resource um, typing management and bringing resources in when there's a request. Um, UNDR is an ongoing risk reduction and they are animal welfare friendly. So um, many other groups have, uh, many other speakers have mentioned um, the UNDRR and the Sendai framework, which they work under. Um, but to answer the question, um, how do we embed this? There's a group already within the UNDRR system, um, and we work actively with the UNDRR in the policy language, um, which is not, uh, which is a global framework. So just understand, it seems very general and very high level. It's because all hundred and I think eighty-five countries have to agree on the text, and it cannot be prescriptive, telling them what to do. It simply has to be a overall frame that they can say, yes, we agree to it, how we do it may be designed by our region or, you know, our national or our subnational um, committees. So that's the second question. Thanks. Perfect. And I think the um, the UN cluster system during that res response operations sits under UN OPTCHA. Um, so um, if that's not taken an animal inclusive approach, um, then there's a potential barrier uh, in, in that area, I, I would assume. Um, the, I'm sorry, I'm just going to address that. So um, UN OCHA yeah. doesn't want to address animals at the moment. Um, and the only reason is it's not standardized training or not standardized systems. Their priority is human centric. So they are not willing to accept certain things. We are um, continuing to work on that puzzle um, with various agencies, um, and of course, watching what's happening in the US with FEMA um, and all the developments in Australia um, and here in Europe um, with uh, DG Echo. So um, we are slowly but surely um, providing evidence of the need and their commitment already, at least in spirit. Um, but then we would like to see them actually commit. Um, and that's going to happen hopefully in the next few years. Um, and have to say that Italy is the only country in Europe at the moment that includes all animals in their disaster law. So when Italy, which has many, many different kinds of disasters, hazards, 
So earthquake, a uh, volcano, floods, storms, mm. landslides, avalanches, just name them, they got them. Um, the challenge therein lies when they request for help from Switzerland, Austria, Germany, wherever, the other teams coming in aren't able to provide the same level of services. So legally, there is a gap. So we're trying to work out that puzzle at the moment. Excellent observations there, Jackson. Um, and so thoughts coming back to the other sort of point was around sort of codes of codes of conduct that have been applied within the uh, humanitarian space. Um, so maybe going back to, to Jen or Gerardo or Adam or, or back to Jackson, um, any sort of thoughts or observations, um, you know, on, on that? Yeah, um, Steve, I think that, you know, one of the pieces that's been really uh, effective for our organization is um, promoting that collaboration within a community or within a country of bringing together the animal rescue groups, the government stakeholders, as well as humanitarian organizations that may be active during a disaster or um, are working on development that will help contribute to building resilience before the next disaster. And, you know, I think you had touched on it earlier that some, or uh, one of the questions had come from uh, the audience that, you know, sometimes these organizations don't like working with the government, right? Like they have a past of not always having positive relationships. And some of that is because of um, issues with companion animal population management. And so having uh, these different audiences come together, you know, not during a disaster. So when times are a little bit more relaxed, you know, they can have these conversations about how to be prepared for the next disaster. And I think that, um, you know, promoting that professionalism of these organizations and having that opportunity to sit with humanitarian organizations to hear their lessons learned and find out what systems are already in place that perhaps the animal component can, you know, add into some of what they're already doing. And, you know, I think it's not so much a, a code of conduct, but it's really having a community work together um, and kind of understand like what works best for their community. And, you know, Jackson was saying that it's really hard with the preparedness and I agree. I mean, it is, it is challenging, but finding opportunities for the variety of parties to come together um, you know, and do a disaster simulation or do a, a vaccination drive where they add a disaster preparedness piece in. But, you know, I think there's opportunities to engage year round. And again, I think sometimes the budget needs to, to be put forth with that. But we, you know, we did a, um, a simulation earlier this year that was based on a community evacuating. And it was one that the local organization that we're working with um, has really facilitated this positive relationship between so many different audiences and it was um it was a blast like you know everybody had such a great time and it was really a really great time for them to see wow these animal people can really be organized too like i don't think we always have that reputation of going deep or staying a long time or being sustainable or or caring about people and i think that um you know there's a lot of opportunity out there for us to to highlight how we can work together and, and kind of all be on the same page uh, for that particular community. No, great examples, Jen. Thank you so much for that work. And it is about trying to identify win-win situations with the community. I remember um, organising a pet-friendly shelter exercise in, in New Zealand, and the next step, which we didn't get to unfortunately, was to then involve the, the public in the exercise. Um, and have them come in and the draw card was going to be that if they came in uh, we would microchip their pet for free um, which is part of that that sort of disaster risk reduction um, um, you know through through microchipping so I think the example that you you gave um, Jen is a great example of as we say if you want to come to the game on Saturday come to practice on Wednesday so um, thanks for that uh, yeah. Adam do you have any yeah. thoughts yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that we've seen on this front is that oftentimes, um, you know, we, we may have had trouble, like, getting the interest necessarily sometimes of the government, but after a disaster occurs, they, they usually very quickly realize this issue with animals because it's it's an issue with, you know, that affects people as well, right, whether it's companion animals or livestock animals that they rely on right so 
um, you know, we found those opportunities that Jen's talking about, like, um, you know, as a part of, you know, the recovery or going into preparedness mitigation for the next time for uh, just a couple quick examples are, you know, like our, our work in Kerala now, you know, we, we were initially there doing dog population management is very hostile <laughs> government to uh, dog dogs for Kerala. They were doing widespread poisoning. They were, you know, it was, it was very difficult. They had no interest in speaking with us. And then a few years ago when they had those major, major floods, you know, we responded on a, a fairly large level because we were already working there in the communities and um, and the government realized like how important this was for the people. People didn't want to evacuate without their animals, you know, all those things we see. And um, and they really embraced our sort of like um, preparation and and mitigation and resiliency work that we do there now. They're a really solid partner. And so I think, you know, similarly, like in Turkey, we hope when we get to that point, Again, that that's a great opportunity to do what you were talking about, Jen, where you sort of like, like everyone realized things didn't go as well as they could have. And so, you know, there's a willingness now to try to get a little more coordinated and organized for the next time. So, you know, we'd like to move into that at some point. I mean, it's unfortunate that sometimes it has to take a disaster for that to occur, um, you know, and also we're limited, right? So we can only work in, you know, we other communities that we work in, we have offices there and we, we may be able to do something even without a disaster. But um, I think building that into that kind of recovery, to me, that's the opportunity that comes with disaster, right? Is a renewed focus on the lives of, I mean, the, um, the role of animals in people's and in the community's lives. And, and that's highlighted to the government usually during a disaster, like um, Gerardo was saying in Chile, right? So like now the government has realized we can't just ignore the animals. And so it's a great opportunity to take that and then to be able to do that other work and get people's attention either between or before the next disaster. And, look, and good, good points, Adam. And look, I think disasters, you know, from my experience, I'd say disasters are just big political events. And I do remember we had a we had a small earthquake in in New Zealand. It wasn't the um, the Christchurch one, it was the one in Kaikoura, and there was a landslide as a result. And there were three cows that were perched on this little part of the landslide, and it made the international news. And pretty much the world, the only question the world had of New Zealand was. What's going to happen to the three cows? Not not what's happened to all the people, but no, what's going to the three cows? So, you know, they they were they were they were rescued by a, a farmer digging a, a ramp into the into the slump. They were rescued, uh, and then probably six months later, they were probably made into hamburger patties. But at that time, they were they were saved in the eyes of the world. Um, so I just wanted to come back just to our, our Q&A, um, and Paulo has written a really good point, and he's been following this conference um, uh, religiously, so thank you so much, Paulo, for this. But you've mentioned, just to remind that according to WAWA, civil society organisations are part of the veterinary services, so thanks for um, uh, reminding us all of that. Now, as we start to wrap up today's panel session, which has been a fantastic uh, discussion on many, many points, I just wanted to whip around the panel and just come back to, to where we started, which was really about you know, the emergence and issues of untrained spontaneous groups turning up to disasters. And so just going around the, the panel, what would be your, your 30 second word of advice or plea to, to these organizations that could be listening in today, looking, looking at you as the larger organizations in terms of the advice that you could offer them to, to make a difference uh, to animals impacted by disaster. Go oh, for it, Jen. Uh, sure. Um, I think my advice would be if there is an opportunity to look for um, a, an, an experienced organization that you could find a mentor, uh, that would be such an incredible opportunity. And I also want to plug that for all of us or all of the organizations that have experienced responding to disasters is that any opportunity you can mentor an up and coming individual or organization, uh, you know, that, that, that's helping so many. So, you know, mentor, mentor, mentor. That advice is golden. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Adam, do you want to go? And then we'll go to Gerardo and Jackson. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and, um, 
you know, the other thing is to sort of, you know, network within your own local, you know, area or region and, and, you know, make those connections, like, you know, as we all know, and unfortunately, I'm sure this probably happens in the humanitarian world, but my experience is in the animal welfare world, like, you know, these groups always competition with each other, they hate each other, they, oh, I don't like that group, you know, but, but really that, that needs to really be set aside, and, and the more that you can sort of coordinate with the peer groups in your area, um, then when something happens, you know, you guys can work together because, um, especially if you're a smaller organization, and it's a large event, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. And I always say like, there's, there's no need to compete. There's more than enough work to go around. <laughs> that we can all do so, you know, make those connections ahead of time, as well as with the government agencies that will be handling disasters and and sort of showing them the importance, you know, and letting them know that you guys are there and you're willing to help them. I think a lot of times with, you know, with these government agencies, it's 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 not necessarily they don't care, but sometimes they don't know how to address the animal issue. And so, you know, if if we if 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 you as your local animal group can be a resource for the government as well. Yeah. So that that pre-work is just as, if not more important than the on the day work so well well said Ed, and thank you so much um Gerardo yeah for the fo <clears throat> excuse me for the folks out there listening to this I think they need we all need to visualize what our response is going to be otherwise it's going to be it's going to be a nature reaction and if you do this systematically you will understand who you need to contact during peace times uh, peace times and um, what is it that uh, that you will be needing to to be a responsible responder and um, as Jane was saying you want to be part of the reconstruction and rehabilitation from day one uh, rather than and, and like you said make no harm so uh, I think uh, plan planning ahead is the best um, best advice I have thanks Loretto really appreciate that and uh, final words over to you Dr Z um, all I can really say is um, to add to what about these people who show up, um, foster, share, um, include, um, invite into the discussion um, so they can better understand that it's not an individual effort, but it's a group effort. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jackson. And look, I think just sort of you know, summarizing, today's been a really good panel discussion about an issue that does affect not just us, our organizations, but the animals that we're here to uh, protect from disaster harm. So um, preparedness is key and uh, building those relationships is certainly going to have advantages, not just for your own organizations, uh, but the animals that we're, we're here to protect. So um, thank you to our panelists, um, Jen Gardner, Adam Paris uh, Scandola, uh, Gerardo Hutez, and Jackson Z. Um, really appreciate the decades of experience that you all brought to today's discussion. And hopefully, those that are viewing it will find it useful in terms of our shared vision. So, thanks, panelists.